He appeared without warning, and he had it all from the beginning. He was a prodigy, a force who redefined the sport, a man who drove on the limit in no other way. He drove on instinct, and instinct drove him, all or nothing. He was hard on equipment, and cars were tougher because of him. He was willful, proud. He carried himself like a gladiator. He was compressed energy, transfigured into speed. He was fierce. He gloried in the crowd, he sought fame. He was a flesh and blood man of mythical status. Mario, a racer, perhaps the best this country has ever known. anybody body you know who is who is the greatest American racing driver I, I, I think 90% literally of the people around the world would say Mario Andretti just like that he drove with a trademark passion flat out all the time he was praised for it when he won and criticized for it when he lost most of the races that I won I had to use 10 tenths I didn't win races by by just waiting, you know, for the rest to, you know, to, to go home and, and, and break down, you know. That was never, you know, the case. So, um, and because of that, I think um, the majority of my wins are, are really good. You know, they, I, I look back and I say, you know what, maybe if I would have been more patient, maybe. You know, I would have won maybe four, five, six more races, you know, but you know what, the heck with it, you know. It, doesn't really, uh, at this stage, you know, I think uh, I wouldn't have changed. I wouldn't change anything. Mario was always competitive. He's, I mean, I've been lucky to, to know him for over 20 years and be fortunate to go snowmobiling and jet skiing with him. He's as competitive there as he is on the racetrack. Mario was one of those drivers. He was one of the bars that, that, uh, that people would compare themselves to. I mean, for sure, when I started driving, you know, if I could, if I could keep up with Mario, or if I could keep up with my dad, I'm doing good. And if I beat them, then I did great. In a career spanning 36 years, his first and last major championships were 19 years apart. This is the story of a champion, Mario Andretti. Andretti and his twin brother Aldo were born to Gigi and Rina Andretti in 1940. Together with their older sister Anna Maria, the family lived in the town of Montona on the Istrian peninsula of Italy. As World War II approached, the two young brothers may not have understood the events of the time, but they could feel that something was not right. During the war, uh, as a kid, what I remember is that uh, there was a lot of confusion, like a, a lot of unrest, you know. Uh, how do you feel that as a kid when you see your parents, like uh, your mother cries more than she should, or there's a lot of political arguments like within the family and you hear stories, horror stories about things that have happened? All I remember is the communist occupation and so forth, which was uh, terrible, but I didn't know much about the life before that other than from what my sister used to keep telling us, you know, how wonderful things were. And uh, did I ever know that life could be different? No, but I knew, you had that sense, you knew that something was wrong. Something was wrong, but for the Andretti family, their biggest problems were still to come. As the map of Europe was redrawn in the post-war years, that region of Italy, including the family vineyard, became part of Yugoslavia. That land was uh, confiscated uh, by the communism, uh, by the Communist Party. Uh, as you know, as you might know, uh, under the communist regime, you cannot own anything. I mean, everything is passed on to the state. Therefore, uh, my dad wound up with nothing, you know, just the clothes on our back. By 1948, Gigi had no choice but to move to a displaced person's camp in Lucca, Italy. It was a temporary arrangement that lasted for seven years. Five years out of the seven years, 
We lived in a uh, room uh, perhaps the size of uh, uh, three of these offices over here, seven families. Seven families, and we, and we were only separated with the army blankets. Despite these conditions, the boys managed to find hope. It came in the form of Italian motor racing hero and champion, Alberto Ascari. In September 1954, Mario and Aldo Andretti went to the Italian Grand Prix at Monza to see their idol. It was an event that would change their lives. Probably the most important event as far as my formative years, as far as uh, determining uh, uh, or de defining uh, something for me. Um, the, it's hard to explain. It's almost impossible for me to explain what I really was feeling in those days. I mean, I, I had such a draw to something like that. I mean, it was, I don't think there was anything else in life that you could have presented to me in any possible way to say, this could be better. This is it. I mean, this gave me the definite, this is Alberto Ascari, this, that's what gave me the, the definite direction, the focus. Uh, and, and I said, this guy, uh, here again, you know, Ascari is a figure, um, represented, um, you know, the true, you know, the, the hero, what someone that I admire so much. I mean, he had his heart hanging right out in front of him. And, and again, like I said, it goes back where uh, how much even kids, you know, I was 14 years old, you could see this thing, you could see that effort, you know, on a part of, uh, of a sky. I said, oh man, there's a guy, I mean, there's a fighter, you know. And so that's the inspiration, you know, that uh, it was so clear. The boys wanted to stay in Europe, hoping to race one day. But the family had to get out of the refugee camp, and this led them to America, where an uncle lived. Gigi decided to make the move. Following a three-year wait for visas, the Andretti family finally arrived at a small town in eastern Pennsylvania known as Nazareth. The Andretti brothers' racing career began in 1959. The year ended with Aldo fighting for his life. After moving to the U.S. in 1955, the Andretti boys felt their racing careers were over before they even started. But within a week... I think it was two or three days or whatever after we came over to the United States, and uh, I came down with this terrible migraine headache and so forth, and, uh, and we were living in a house with uh, my Uncle Tony and Aunt Mary at the time, and I was upstairs in the bedroom, and uh, all of a sudden I hear... Uh, noise downstairs and so forth, you know, and I hear, hey, Aldo, 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 and here was Mario. Running up the stairs, he found out there was a racetrack in Nazareth. I never had a medicine that ever cured a migraine headache like that in my whole life. I mean, <laughs> like this, and I don't know whatever happened, like a miracle, you know. The headache was gone, and we found out there was a track. What looked good about it was that it looked unsophisticated, so because of that, it looked very approachable. I said, you know what, you know, when we saw Monza, uh, I mean, it looked like, uh, okay, we were there, you know, but we were 20, mi 20 million miles away from reality. Here, it looked like, you know what, we could pursue this. Mario, Aldo, and a few school friends built their first race car a couple of years later, using a 1948 Hudson Hornet. And in March 1959, the Andretti twins were ready to race. One helmet, one car, and after a coin toss, Aldo was the driver. But because it was their first race, he would have to start last in a field of 26. And he goes, he comes right through the field, he wins this heat. So I figured, wow, well, you know, win the heat. And he did the same thing in a feature, dead last in a feature, and just blowing through the pack, you know. And, and I, I just couldn't believe it. I figured, man, I gotta do the same. The Andretti's racing career had begun without their father's blessing. In fact, Gigi had forbidden them to race, and they did so without his knowledge. By the end of 1959, Aldo and Mario were consistent winners, and they both qualified for an invitational race in Hatfield, Pennsylvania. It would be tough. They had a sportsman car that would be running against the faster modifieds. Mario was finished with his qualifying heat. Aldo was on the track. 
So he was running like third, and he was running right behind, uh, I think, Freddie Adams, who was a track champion. And I think it was Freddie. Well, I was trying to pass him, you know? And he should have been, obviously, just happy to be there, qualifying, just right. And, and, and I was trying, you know, I was trying to just Hang on, you know, a couple more laps. And I remember seeing Mario trying to slow me down. And all of a sudden, I look on the back straight, we're coming out of turn two. And I hit the fence, caught one of the wheels, and that thing flipped for, you know, for a long time. I mean, that car just went end over end. It must have knocked me out very early because I don't remember anything. Uh, I, I remember just losing the car. Immediately, he was uh, in a coma, and Taken to the hospital, he was, uh, uh, you know, he was given his last rites. I mean, I mean, he was breathing, and he was, but he was, uh, he was totally out. The next morning, uh, the doctor said, uh, "We need the boy's parents here. We'll call the police." So, you know, of course, you know, I had to face the music, and uh, I felt like a criminal, you know, that uh, for not telling him and. But I, I had a sense of relief at the same time, too, you know, that, okay, now he knows, okay, you know, what can he do, just beat me to death or something, you know? The problem thing I remember is waking up uh, in the room, you know, it was, I don't know, it was nice uh, blue walls. It was a bright room, and look around, it was my dad who was standing there. <laughs> I said, where am I? I said, well, you're in the hospital. <laughs> Poor guy, he had tears in his eyes. Mario was there. I said, what happened? Oh, he said, Hatfield. I'm like, oh, man. I said, we're racing, you know. And it was, at that point in time, see, I knew that my dad knew we were racing. And the first words that he told me, that he spoke to me, he says, he said, Mario, I'm sure glad you had to be the one to face the old man. He said those, and uh, that was the best thing I could have ever heard at that because I knew he was thinking clearly. So I uh, figured, well, I'm glad, to, I'm glad that I'm in the hospital. You can't touch me. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, we have all the back. For his part, Gigi eventually, if reluctantly, accepted his son's racing careers. Unlike his brother, Aldo never graduated to Indy cars. Instead, he was content to compete in sprint cars and midgets and finally retired from racing in 1969. By then, Mario had already become one of the fastest men at Indianapolis. As Mario Andretti achieved more and more success racing near his home, he started to think about racing at a higher level. Ultimately, he wanted to compete in USAC Champ Cars and the Indianapolis 500. My objective was not for me to become Nazareth track champion and continue that, you know, yeah, yeah, as much as you wanted us, but this is, I call the stepping stone. I mean, from here, I want to go to the next, next. What I wanted to do, I get into midgets. So, in 1961, Mario began to race midgets. He knew he had the ability to make it to Indianapolis, but he lacked financing. My wife, Deanna, had to go to work, and in fact, every penny that she was earning, I was using Deanne Andretti worked in a garment factory. It didn't really bother me because I always just gave him my check home anyways. So uh, that's the way he used it. And um, uh, the only thing that did bother me is when I did quit my job, I was eight and a half months pregnant. And he said, why did you quit? And I said, well, I was missing quite a bit of work now because I just was sick all the time. <laughs> so that's... Um, that's that part I objected to, but then after that, then it's like, oh, we won't be able to get the engine done over this week. <laughs> you know? At the same time, there was a more serious concern for Mario and Deanne. This was an era when racing was extremely dangerous. 64, 65, uh, when in two accidents, I mean, I was in Reading, Pennsylvania, it was Red Regal and Judd Larson, my very good friend, Judd Larson, who were killed in the same accident. We go to Ascot, and uh, Dick Atkins, who was my teammate when I was driving for Wally Muskowski, uh, he was killed uh, along with Don Brand. So now they got two races. We lost four guys. I mean, uh, that was just horrible. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But those were the reality of those days. Thank God I was young. 
because I think when you're younger, you don't have as many fears. But um, it was it was very difficult. It, I think a lot of the way to deal with it was not to become too friendly with people, because you never knew if they were going to be there after the race, and that was very hard. And every once in a while, you would let your guard down, and every once in a while, you did lose somebody. It was very, very difficult. Despite the odds, Andretti was able to survive, even thrive in sprints and midgets. And six years after his first race at Nazareth, Mario Andretti was going to Indianapolis. Although he was a rookie, he created an immediate buzz. And I'd heard about this little lad, Mario Andretti, uh, the man, they said, who run closer to the wall than anybody else. I arrived at Indy, and uh, I had no rear-engine car experience whatsoever. Uh, we had, up to that point, we had raced the Roadster, and, uh, and before I know I'm qualifying. You know, it was horrifying for me because it was the first time that I've ever, ever faced that kind of type of crowd, that type of uh, pressure. Jim McGee has worked in CART and USAC for about 35 years. He was with Andretti for his first race in 1964 and for his last in 1994. We were probably down 150 horsepower, and we only had two days of practice in that car, and we qualified fourth for a guy that had never, never been there. I mean, uh, right behind Clark and Parnelli and these guys uh, and Foyt that were veterans. And then, then we proved the fact that we were competitive uh, by finishing third in the race. And Firestone signed him to a contract uh, for a million dollars over like five year period. So he went from uh, somebody earning 200 bucks a month to a millionaire in a matter of six months. Two months later, this young phenom scored his first champ car victory on the road course at Indianapolis Raceway Park. Through the rest of the 1965 season, consistent finishes won Mario the USAC National Championship, a tremendous feat for a rookie driver. The next season, he won eight races, dominated the series, and captured his second title. But in his first four tries, he had yet to win the biggest race of all, Indy. It was time for Mario to try something new with a new team and a new car. The plan in 1969 for me was to run that Lotus Ford. And the car arrived late, like they always do, and, uh, but right away, it was quick. You know, the car was quick. You know, whenever on the track, I would always set a quick time. Of course, the car was destroyed, and we didn't have another one. The only option was to use the backup Brawner Hawk. It was a good car, but it wasn't engineered for the high speeds of Indianapolis. And we never really solved the cooling problems of that car. You know, we had to hang on the short tracks, ugly outside radiators and things you know to, to cool it and um and we didn't want to qualify with that so we got rid of it and uh then we figured we'll hang it on for the race uh, uh they won't let us do that so we had a pretty good panic going on there because then we had to find a way to get a radiator in it that they couldn't see and so uh we had to go underneath the bottom of the car and cut the uh the tub away and we had to put an aluminum radiator up in the uh, bottom of it. And the 1969 Plasma of our race is on. Turn one, come in, Mike Ahern. And Mario Andretti dives low into turn one to take the lead, followed by A.J. Boyd, Bobby Unser. Andretti's out in front. In the race, on the first uh, 10 laps, the temperature gauge just started going up, and it was it was really hot. I mean, unbelievable. The, uh, the engine temperature, um, the water was, we were running, you know, 220 all day and about 270 on the oil. And uh, I figured, no way I'm going to finish this race. But I figured, if we're going to go, let's go out in a blaze of glory. You know, let's try to lead this thing. After a while, once it's settled, you know, once uh, Foyt dropped out and Ruby, uh, then, you know, the pressure was off. You know, there was just a matter of finishing. But just something about coming down, you know, on that stripe of bricks there to just put that under your belt. It just needed to be done. I probably could have gone maybe another another lap or two. I don't think anymore. You know, that's a, the car was used up. Mario and Deanne's financial woes would end forever. But for Deanne, there would be a price to pay. The year he won Indianapolis then in 69, that, that was a big eye-opener. 
because that's when I felt like, um, I don't know if I really do like this, because then I didn't have my husband anymore. Then he was public territory. And um, I did not appreciate it that. I, I ended up learning to live with it because that's part of the, the whole industry, any kind of sports industry. But I did have a problem with that. 14 years after arriving in the United States, the son of displaced Italian immigrants had become a household name. There is one characteristic that separated Mario from most other drivers, versatility. For example, in 1967, in only his second attempt, he won the Daytona 500. On race day, Andretti had to run his low drag qualifying setup, but he was given a more powerful Ford engine than he was used to. He was forced to change his driving style and really slide the car through the corners. It's not normally my style to drive loose or, or weird like that, but, uh, but the car stuck. I, I, f I had a feel for it, and I hardly had to turn left to go in the corner. I let the car just roll in and then correct. And had some guys follow me, spook. That's why I had to go for a lead, a hook or crook. If there were three or four cars, I mean, that car, I was all over the place. So I had to just kind of dive and, and, and dive to the inside, I mean, get the car to take a set and I mean, dis be decisive, go to the front. And uh, I had to drive so aggressively. And, and you know, that part, because <laughs> I said, worried some guys, you know. Uh, Richard said, hey, he said, we just, we figured, no way you're gonna be there at the end. I said, well, that's fine, that's good, as long as I got your message. The 12 hours of Sebring is one of the great endurance races of the world. And Dreddy won it three times. His most memorable victory came in 1970. The Ferrari 512 he was driving retired with mechanical failure after leading by as much as 50 miles. And a Porsche 908 driven by Peter Revson and actor Steve McQueen seemed poised to win. With less than an hour to go, another Ferrari was fourth, a lap behind the Porsche. Andretti hadn't expected to drive again, but team boss Mauro Fogheri was desperate. The team had not won for three years. Passing up Grand Prix star Jackie Ix, he brought the car in for Andretti. When it came in, it threw me in a car, but I was on a mission because uh, I really wanted to, uh, to be, not really Revson as bad, and I wanted to make sure that uh, this Steve McQueen wouldn't win the race, you know, because he didn't, you know, I felt Revson was not gonna get the, the due credit. But we knew we had to potentially make one more stop. That stop was made with exactly one lap to go. And Mario came in so fast. It was just one of those things where, uh, you know, you're just, you know, you're just driven by something else. Mario came to a stop right in front of me. I have never seen such determination on a man's face. It was really almost inhuman. My adrenaline took over then. He popped the clutch, the tires smoked, he fishtailed desperately, almost lost control as he left the pit, and then ran the car at full speed down the pit through the crowd in the night with people jumping to get out of the way. I was on a mission. Andretti's victory at Sebring was typical of his early career success. I really feel this race brought together Mario's personality at the wheel with a situation that justified it. Mario at that point was hell-bent for leather. He would attack every race and go flat out through it. Suddenly there was a situation that called for that. He recognized it. He was ready absolutely to come back on his shield, but he wasn't going to come back a loser. In just five years, from 1965 to 1969, he had won the Indy 500, 30 Champ Car races, and three Champ Car national titles, the Daytona 500, the 12 Hours of Sebring, and pole position for his first Formula One Grand Prix. But in the 1970s, that magic seemed to desert him. Retirements and frustration became a frequent occurrence, especially in Indianapolis. But the good thing about it is, even though like from 70 to 75 or 6, uh, the my Indy car, uh, you know, winnings were, were not that good because, you know, cars were really junk. Uh, and uh, still I had other things that I was doing, you know, in, like I said, I do a lot of sports car races. So I was always winning something. 
you know, in some area or on, on the dirt or whatever. I always had something good going, so it was never a big letdown. He may not have been achieving the level of success to which he had become accustomed, but that did not diminish his competitive spirit. He ran the Can-Am series. He won the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. And he was IROC champion. He was runner-up in the 1974 and 1975 Formula 5000 championships. He continued to race sprints and midgets throughout his career, winning the USAC Dirt Car Championship in 1974. I love the dirt, and um, again, it was a very unlikely thing to do, especially when you got into the 70s, you know, I mean, modern era, because I would go, like, from a dirt track to Formula One, you know, there was just a, a huge gap here, you know, to, 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 to overcome, but, but I loved it. And quite honestly, I think a lot of that was even good, was good for me, you know, car control and everything else. Uh, but uh, dirt racing is something that I've always enjoyed. But occasional victories did not satisfy Mario. He wanted another challenge. The memory of Alberto Ascari dueling with Fancio at the Italian Grand Prix was still with him. He wanted to win the World Drivers' Championship. That would require a return to his native Europe. It was a move that had its beginnings in 1965, when Andretti was a rookie at Indianapolis and made a point of seeking out Team Lotus owner Colin Chapman. And I said to him, I said, uh, uh, someday I would like to do Formula One. I'd love to do Formula One, you know. And, and he said, uh, when you think you're ready, call me. That's what he said. That's all I needed. That's all I needed. Mario Andretti made his first Formula One start at Watkins Glen, New York in 1968. Incredibly, he put the car on the pole. For a man who had never even seen the track, it was a staggering accomplishment. Bob Dance was a member of Colin Chapman's Lotus teams throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It was most surprising to hear him say to Chapman, you tell me when you want me to put it on pole position. And sure enough, he did what he did what he said, and he was on pole position. And Chapman was so chuffed about the whole thing, he said, you know, this is just like having Jimmy Clark all over again. Though Andretti's Lotus failed him in the race, he had served notice to Chapman and the Formula One establishment. For the next six years, Andretti was an occasional Grand Prix driver with various teams while continuing to concentrate on his champ car career in the States. Despite his part-time status, Andretti won the South African Grand Prix in 1971 driving for Ferrari. It was only his 10th Formula One Grand Prix race. Driving Ferrari, that's the romance. And he, uh, Mr. Ferrari, somehow he knew how much I loved uh, driving and how much I loved what I was doing. And he sensed that. And, and that's when he, he, he sort of warms up. He always warmed up to drivers that, that did that. 1974 was a transitional year for Andretti. He drove in many series searching for direction. By the end of the year, he'd found it. He would become a full-time Formula One driver at last. The experience, however, would test more than his driving skills. The car built by the Vell Militich Parnelli Jones combination in 1975 was a failure. And so you try to keep your chin up and uh, stay encouraged and uh, and optimistic and all that but you know what it's it's hell it's pure hell I mean it doesn't do a damn thing for you because um, uh, you know when it goes one race after the other all of a sudden then you start doubting your own abilities too that's why uh, I you know the lean years never did a darn thing for me except to create misery at the third race of the 1976 season at Long Beach, Mario found out in the grid that his team was folding. God, I mean, that was news to me, you know, so obviously uh, I was not a happy camper and, and I was really confused and upset. And, uh, and then the car went out with, um, I think, a broken uh, water pipe, but just as well, because I might have crashed even that day. I was so upset. Andretti's career was at a crossroads. So too was Colin Chapman's, whose once dominant Lotus team had not won a race in almost two years. In the eight years since Andretti had won the pole for Chapman at Watkins Glen, both had enjoyed spectacular success, but separately. Now they were both at the bottom of the sport. A fateful breakfast meeting at Long Beach would change all that. 
ultimately reversing the fortunes of both men. And I said, Dean, I'll call it. I said, uh, as they say, misery loves company. I said, maybe we can make something out of this. I said, I want to be in Formula One. I want to do it. Let's, let's join up together. And I knew that if there was a chance for a championship, it was going to be with him at that point. Andretti and Chapman had a big mountain to climb. The 1976 Lotus was not competitive. It was a slug, you know, really slow in a straight line, didn't have, a, you know, much aerodynamic. But things changed very quickly. Andretti and Chapman had a chemistry that inspired each other and rallied the Lotus team. Their skills complemented each other's. Andretti's renowned abilities as a test driver were never more valuable, and Chapman was able to interpret Mario's technical feedback and implement changes to the race car. Their reward was pole position and victory at the last Grand Prix of the 1976 season, just 12 races after the two had met for breakfast. That race, run in the rain in Japan, is considered by Andretti to be his best drive in Formula One. The next year, Chapman designed an innovative car which created high levels of aerodynamic downforce by means of ground effects, a concept new to Formula One. But what we were lacking desperately is straight line speed. A lot of people don't realize actually uh, how hard we really had to drive because uh, if we didn't corner uh, three tenths quicker than the next round, we'd be passed. I mean, like a slug. Andretti won four races in 1977 more than any other driver. One of those victories came at Monza, where the memory of his boyhood idol, Alberto Ascari, remained vivid. I mean, he was long gone after he was killed. Uh, um, in, uh, in Monza practicing. Uh, he's still, I was kind of uh, uh, drawing from him, uh, you know, throughout my career, what might have, he might have done in my place and on and on. So he just, uh, the inspirations w was still there because uh, he was so good, you know, so excellent, such a fighter and, and cool at the same time. Combined with his earlier victory at Long Beach, the Italian-born American now had the distinction of winning races in both his native and adopted lands in a single season. However, poor reliability would ultimately cost Andretti the 1977 championship. But the stage was set. 1978 would see Mario once again a champion, this time champion of the world. began the 1978 season running the 1977 car, and he had a new teammate, Ronnie Peterson. Peterson tested the brand new Lotus 79 first, while Mario was racing in the States. It wasn't until the sixth race of the year that Andretti got his hands on it. And he came back and, and they said, um, I said, Ronnie, uh, how's the car? I said, hmm, this Good, you know, but he, I knew Ronnie, and I had a twinkle in him, and, and I knew he wasn't giving. I said, uh, you planning to race it? No, well, maybe, but it will not finish. You know, and the car will break, you know. So, and I says, um, I said, Colin, I want to race that car. Andretti did race that car that weekend in Belgium, and it won the first time out. So dominant was the Lotus 79 that for the rest of the season, only two men would have a shot at the championship. Andretti and Peterson. It was a classic matchup. Andretti's technical savvy against Peterson's miraculous car control. I think I had better mechanical knowledge than he did, which I think helped me. But, you know, that car control I used to envy. Beating Peterson, who was as fast as anyone in Formula One, would take all of Andretti's driving skill and technical expertise. There's certain things that I knew that I had I could cover myself with some of the uh, uh, the tricks that I used to do with um, staggers and things that nobody was onto, and I wouldn't even let Colin onto it. And and that was an ace in the hole that I had that I had that really worked for me. I got onto the uh, stagger thing, but they were missing one thing, and then Colin didn't know what I was searching for either. Uh, totally, uh, I was jacking the car. I was. Jack and Wade on the car. And I used to play with that, and, he's, and he'd, sometimes he'd roll his eyes, but, but he'd never question it. Even though the two were competing for the most prestigious prize in international motor racing, Andretti's and Peterson's friendship flourished. 
when you respect their ability, you can only admire them. And then if the, the person is a decent person, honest person, then, uh, you know, then you just develop that uh, strong relationship that's sincere and, and it's good. Even the stories in the press that said Mario was beating Ronnie Peterson because Andretti was the team's lead driver didn't hurt their relationship. Whenever it's implied, it kind of burns me up because it's really unfair, actually. And Ronnie would back me up if he was here today because that's why we maintain that kind of relationship. And he knew, you know, he knew that I, you know, uh, he wasn't giving me anything. American Grand Prix driver Dan Gurney could sympathize with Andretti's frustration. The European press has been very partisan for their own guys, you know, and, and it's, it's nationalistic to an extent that Americans uh, aren't used to. At the Grand Prix of Austria, at the crucial point in the championship, Andretti crashed on the first lap. I always felt that I should have matured to the point of really being a little more patient. Uh, I'm, yeah, do I know that uh, sometime even on the first lap, you know, I made some mistakes in Formula One events, uh, you know, that I shouldn't have. Um, do I regret that? I says, you know, I should know better, you know, but uh, then do I say, do I want to go in there with much less fire? I don't want that either. Peterson won that race at the Oster Reich ring and closed to within only nine points. Andretti responded to the pressure by winning in Holland, with his teammate Blue to his rear wing the whole way, a victory he says was one of the most satisfying of his career. Then came the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. If Andretti could beat Peterson, he would all but clinch the title. The duel never materialized. Ronnie Peterson crashed on the first lap, a victim of another driver's mistake. Both his legs were crushed. Andretti had won the championship he had dreamed of his whole life at the very track where he had first watched his boyhood hero race. But for Mario, there was no joy. A somber Andretti crossed the finish line first in the restarted race, but was disqualified for a dubious jump start. Numbed by Peterson's accident and injuries, the team didn't bother protesting. It's, again, it's one of those times when you say why, you know, why does life have to be so unfair certain times? And this was one of them. You know, it um, uh, had, should have been the happiest day of my life. Tragically, Ronnie Peterson died later that night, a victim of what some said was inadequate medical treatment. He's a man that uh, should have been a world champion. He fits the category. Um, uh, I, you know, it's just like uh, the tragic uh, losses of all time, no question, the tragic waste. Uh, first of all, you know, his injuries should not have been life-threatening and all that sort of thing. Um, again, uh, I would have enjoyed seeing him uh, win a world championship. He deserved it. He was that type of guy, a guy who could win. He had that quality, and, um, and as a friend, I would have loved to, you know, to have been able to grow old with him. Had Andretti's win been allowed to stand in the 1978 Italian Grand Prix, he would have finished his career with 13 Grand Prix victories, tying him with Alberto Escari. In the 1980s, Mario Andretti returned to America. He won his fourth Champ Car title in 1984, racing with the Newman Haas team. 84 was, uh, was another perfect example of uh, doing the right thing, really moving forward and, uh, and taking some chances. That's probably 84 was a pivotal year, even though it was early on, for this team to really, they needed that uh, boost to win a championship and establish the team is a absolute force to be reckoned with against the established teams that were in, in place at the time. By now, Mario's two sons, Michael and Jeff, had begun racing careers of their own. His daughter, Barbie, was competing in equestrian events. The oldest son, Michael, was racing full-time in kart, and he was competitive right away. 
I remember somebody come to me and says, you know what? Competition is bad enough. Do you have to go out there and breed them? You know, there was <laughs> Alan Jones told me that. There was already another father and son combination in cart, Al Unzer Sr. and Jr. One year earlier in the 1983 Indianapolis 500, Al Jr., who was several laps down, was accused of blocking Tom Sneva in an effort to help his father, who was running second. Mario and Michael Andretti vowed never to be involved in a similar controversy. There was nobody tougher. I mean, it's almost like I think when he saw me come in his mirrors, he uh, would stand up in the seat and just make it harder for me to, you know, pass him. He was, there still has never been anybody as hard as my dad to pass for me um, on a racetrack. You know, he just would just make it tough. Father's Day, June 15th, 1986, Portland, Oregon. Mario and Michael Andretti were about to finish 1-2 for the first time, and Michael looked like he had the race in the bag. I basically had the two-lap lead on this field at one point. You start, you know, settling and make sure that, uh, you know, you bring it home second. We were having a problem with my fuel pickup. We weren't picking up, like, the last seven gallons in the tank. So we knew we were going to be in trouble come the end of the race. Two laps or so from the end, uh, I started to get some screams from, uh, from my team manager. He says, uh, hey, he said, Michael is having some fuel pickup problems. So then I really stood up on a seat, you know, so now I have a shot at it. Coming off the last corner, I stood, I looked and I saw Dad and little Al in my mirror because they were racing for position. I was really upset I couldn't pass Mario. That was my big thing, you know, and, and uh, I had been working him for a long time, several laps, and I was just right there. Come off the last corner, I thought I was okay, and all of a sudden the engine just hesitated. And that's when he got bigger and bigger. And and I had to run at him and run at him. And I saw Michael on the side going slow, and I went, oh, man, this is going to be close. And then it kicked in again. Then it was a drag race, and, and he just beat me by, you know, a matter of inches. And I just nipped him. And, uh, and I mean, it was like this far. At that point, I, we didn't even know really who won the race um, because it was that close. Because of the momentum. I thought that I, you know, I felt that I won, but I wasn't really sure. And then when we came in, it was just like, it was a killer, you know? Certainly, he deserved to win, no question, but, uh, but I took it. It was very disappointing, but I knew that that race, being on Father's Day and having Dad beat me in the closest race ever, that that was going to be one race to remember for the rest of our lives. In the late 1980s, as Mario approached his 50th birthday, the victories came less frequently, but he remained competitive and was always a threat to win. At the 1991 Milwaukee 200, Michael, Aldo's son John, and Mario made for an all-Andretti podium. Never before had three members of the same family finished one, two, three. Later that year, Michael won the kart championship, clinching it at Laguna Seca, where Mario finished third. Then came the 1992 Indianapolis 500. It was a day the Andretti family will never forget. First, Mario hit the turn four wall and broke his foot. Then Jeff crushed his legs after a head-on collision also in turn four. But there was still hope. Michael was dominating the race, all the while asking for constant updates on the condition of his brother. Every yellow, I'd be asking, what, how's Jeff, how's Jeff, you know? And, and they just weren't telling me, and I knew that that was not good. And, and so, very difficult to keep my concentration, but what kept me going was, I'm gonna win this for him, you know? And, and then, you know, 10 laps to go, the engine, the belt on the front engine breaks, and that's it, so it was just a terrible day. I thought that was the low part of uh, my career, low part of my life, primarily because of uh, Jeff's injuries. And, um, and then the fact that Michael, you know, was so strong and he was denied that, you know, that win, and um, he deserved it so much. Mario's fortunes would take a different turn one year later. Determined to win in his fifth decade of racing, on April 4th, 1993, Mario Andretti won at the Phoenix International Raceway. It was his 52nd and final IndyCar victory. Mario Andretti retired from kart the next year, but he left with the all-time closed course record for speed when he qualified for the 1993 Michigan 500 at 234 miles per hour. The only major sports event that Mario Andretti has never won 
is the 24 Hours of Le Mans. But don't be surprised if he makes a bid to win it someday. Le Mans program still be, becomes an option when I'll be 86. That'll still be an open option for me. So uh, at this point, I'll never officially retire uh, from any phase of the sport anymore. Um, I'll just fade away, you know. But um, uh, as long as I see the opportunity and I, if it's the right thing, I'll take it. And, um, and again, that will be open as long as I breathe. He may no longer be in the cockpit, but Mauro Andretti has refused to turn his back on racing. His love of the sport is too great for that. For him, retirement means crisscrossing the country to be in the Newman Haas pits, helping Michael win. I'm just sort of another eyes, and uh, and again, like you said, the perspective that I bring there is, I know, you know, there's a time that he wants to know something that somebody may miss, and that's when I try to put my two cents in there sometimes. I think your entry up here looked better with this car yeah, than with yeah. the other one. Right. You look more sure. He has business affiliations that keep him in demand and a new profession one that he has tackled with the same zest as driving. It's not that, uh, you know, we got involved in a winery uh, because of my father. I mean, uh, it's just that uh, it started making sense. Yes, my father, you know, he, uh, he hasn't seen this, but uh, as I talk about it, it seems so far-fetched, but I, wanted, I want him to see it, I want him to be proud of it. Like he did as a driver, Andretti exhibits a special style at his winery in the Napa Valley. And whether he's talking tire stagger or vintage wine, he continues to display characteristic, understated charms. It has been three decades since Mario won the Indy 500, four decades since he won his first race. Mario Andretti had the careers of three champions and drove with a passion that few have ever known. I believe he is the most accomplished driver perhaps of all time, simply because he has driven and won consistently in a wider range of race cars than any other racing driver. We said earlier that Chapman said it was like having Jimmy Clark all over again. I think I'd better stop at that, because that comment coming from Chapman uh, gives one a an indication of Mario's ability, I think. I don't think there's anyone that I know of that's in the sport, that has ever been in the sport, that has loved it more than him and is more passionate for it. And I think he gave everything and still gives everything to racing. And I'll tell you one thing, uh, above everything else, I really love the sport of motor racing. I mean, I truly, I can be one that I'll say, I truly love the sport of motor racing. I love driving, I really love driving.